Let's pray. Father, thank you for the awesome privilege of being under the Word of God. We ask, Lord, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to rest upon the ministry of the Word. And we pray that we would sense your nearness. We would sense as though you were speaking directly from your heart into ours. And that, God, we would be changed by what you have to say through this Bible study. But we know that this is the end of a week where people work, study, have different things on their plates, but we pray that you would quicken our minds, quicken our hearts, quicken our bodies to give you full attention. And Lord, ultimately we're praying for change. We are poor in spirit, and we recognize that there are areas in our life that are not fully developed in the likeness of Christ. So give us the grace to spot those things out that we may bring them before you, because we know that you are more than willing to make us like your son. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have now reached the transitional point in the book of Deuteronomy in that Moses has this huge sermon that he's preaching to the second generation of the Israelites that came out of Egypt. For the first four chapters, Moses has been focusing on reflecting on past events that God has essentially manifested himself in, in both discipline and blessing towards his people. He's rehearsing, he's uh, retelling stories of the things that this generation and the prior generation have witnessed with their own eyes in order to motivate them to step into faith into the promised land. And here's the transition. They are now entering into a hearing of Moses' speech that focuses not on necessarily testimonies, though there are some, but mainly focusing on the law. Mainly focusing on the commands that God has given them. And for them to hear it again, not just for the sake of being reminded of what God had said, but for the purpose and the intention for this generation to make their own commitment, their own covenant with God. Because the first generation did that at Mount Sinai. And now the second generation is up. They're at the place in which they have to make their own decision whether they want to enter into true, genuine, lifelong relationship with God. And this tells us already a very important lesson from the book of Deuteronomy. No matter if you grew up with parents that had a covenant with God, no matter if you grew up hearing the word of God like this generation did their whole lives, God is expecting for you and I to make our own decision to follow God. This tells me that this is not inherited. That even though they were there and saw their parents make the covenant with God, did not mean that it transferred to them. God expects all of us, for every person here, especially that grew up in the church, you have to make a choice. There has to have been a moment in your life, even if you grew up in Sunday school, youth group, hearing sermons every week, went to conferences, none of that matters. None of the hearing matters unless you have come to a point in your life where you have made a conscious decision that you will follow Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, I'm faced with the objection that many people feel they don't have a testimony because they have not gone into the world, done stupid things, got some scars from sin, and so they don't really have this testimony that they've come to Christ. This text proves to us that you don't need to go out into Egypt and hang out for a while before you make a covenant with God. You could have grown up your whole life under the wings of the Almighty, but you still have to look to him in the eyes and say, I will give my life to you from this moment on. From verse 44 down, we, we just see that Moses is giving us the location of where he is about to make this transition in his message. It's in the same place that we were in chapter 1, right at the border of the promised land, right at the Jordan River for them to enter into what God had promised for them. And this is a reminder for us, for the book of Deuteronomy as we study it. The book of Deuteronomy teaches us as believers in the new covenant that God does not want to just take you out of Egypt, which is a picture of salvation. God wants to bring you into the promised land. God wants to plant you. And by our obedience and our willingness, inhabit His will, His blessings, His fruit, His presence, and that it is in the promised land that God says, from there you will be a light to the nations. God wants to make us a light to the nations. So all of this is types and shadows. 
And the Deuteronomy text is teaching us that this is where God wants us to be. Not wandering in the wilderness to ultimately die and waste our lives like the first generation. So, right from the get-go, I'm sure we never heard an altar call from the beginning of the message. But here it is. If you grew up in the church, you have to make a choice for yourself. If you haven't made a choice, why wait? Why wait? Here's the second truth from this point of the book of Deuteronomy. Not only if my parents grew up, and I grew up under the covenant-making parents that God has allowed me to live under, even if my parents failed to live faithfully for God, even if my parents live hypocritically, even if my parents have fallen short in a grave way, that does not give me the permission to live how I want. It gives me the opportunity to learn from their mistakes and make the right choices. Hypocrisy is a powerful thing. We're going to hear that in a moment. But don't let the devil use it to cripple you because you saw a father or a mother who lived inconsistently with what they've taught. That is the devil's trick. And God will not give us a free pass because of how our parents failed to live. We still have to make a choice. And what we can do from that moment is say, I will not do it the way they did it. I will not be a husband like my dad was. I will not be like a mother like my mom was. We all make mistakes, and I understand there's more serious situations than others, but generally speaking, when there is consistent hypocrisy, don't let Satan use that for you not to make a covenant with God. Let it propel you to say, I will live more faithfully to God and for God. So we come from verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 5 to verse 21. What you and I read, if you've read this chapter, is a repetition of what? Exodus, what specifically Exodus? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. God revealing His standard. God revealing His character through these commands. For the purpose of the people hearing it and making a commitment that they will do their part in this conditional covenant that if I'm going to remain in a relationship with God, I'm going to abide by these rules. Whenever you and I face any text in the Bible that repeats itself, what is the practice that we must take in order to retrieve revelation? This is true in the Gospels. If you've read the Gospel accounts, you've read one parable and you've read it in Matthew and Mark and Luke and you've read stories and miracles that happen in, in different texts. Whenever we face a text that repeats itself in the Bible, what is the practice that we must take in order to retrieve our revelation? Right. Comparison. It takes a little bit of extra time, but it's worth it. So when we come to a text like this in Deuteronomy 5, I'm now invited to either just read on and say, okay, it's important because it's repeating itself, or I go to Exodus 20, and I take both lists of the Ten Commandments, and I see if there's any emphasis, any repetitions, or any differences that might highlight something. So this is Bible study. And what we're going to do is you're going to go to Exodus 20. For the next few moments in this place, we're going to compare Exodus 20 to Deuteronomy 5. Just through your own, your own text, look through it, and see if you can point out one or many differences with these list of commands. If you think you have something, just lift up your hand and we'll glean from you. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. What are some differences? Any difference in the first commandment? Second? Third? Seventh commandment? Eighth? Look at the fourth commandment. What does this deal with? The Sabbath. Look at verse 11 of Exodus 20. And see what God says in that portion in the original command. He says, And for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the motivation for the original Sabbath commandment was God set up a model for you and I in creation that He worked six days and on the seventh day He had rested to enjoy and to 
essentially observe his creation and to declare his own goodness through it. So the, the motivation for the Sabbath keeping in Exodus was rest. Rest. But when you come to Deuteronomy, look at verse 14 and 15. This is where it's similar, verse 14. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. Here's a little difference. That your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And here's the big difference. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So there's a detail added in the Deuteronomy account, and this is the detail that's added. Genesis, learn from Genesis and Exodus 20 and rest like God rested. Deuteronomy doesn't emphasize rest as much as it does reflection. Reflection. And so in order to motivate the people that are coming into the promised land to know how to treat the male and female servants, God says, hey, 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 you were a servant. You knew what rest was beneficial and how it was beneficial to you. So pass that on to your servants when you go into the promised land. But it's more than that. It's deeper than that. He says, I want you to altogether use this day to remember how you were a slave in Egypt and to reflect upon my deliverance and how I brought you out with a mighty hand and, and brought you into this very place that you're enjoying week after week. And so there's something there because we are not bound by the Sabbath. In the New Covenant, Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. He's our rest. We rest every single day. But there is valuable principle in this in that yes, there is great practice in resting our bodies. It's a true principle universally that I can do more in six days than I can in seven. And when I take the time to rest my body, my mind, I'm replenished, I'm refreshed, and I can move forward with greater energy to the things that God has called me to. So we must take that upon ourselves lest we harm ourselves. God has given us some principles of rest. But what rest is to the body, reflection is to the soul. What rest is to the body, is reflection to the soul. So there, there's something there about meditation. There's something there about taking the time, the same way I would take time to rest. I must also reflect. I must also meditate. I must also give my soul some care in order for it to also remain fresh. Think of a sprinkler that's continually going off. Just lightly, it's, not, it's just not like rushing waters. It's just light sprinkles that keeps the grass green and moist and lively. That is something that we can visualize for our own souls. I must continue to water my own soul. And it's gonna take discipline like it will take discipline to rest. Unfortunately, we live in a day in which it's a discipline to stop and actually relax and reflect. And we gotta do the same thing for our souls. And that's what we do here on Fridays. And that's what we do here on Sundays. And when we miss those days, what we do is we miss out on what we need to do for our souls, and that's reflect what God has done for me, and what life is all about. I pray that every Friday you come here after a long week of work, I pray that every time you come Sunday morning, you would be reminded of who God is. You'd be reminded of why you're on this earth. You'd be reminded of why you do what you do. You wouldn't get caught up in the day-to-day -day things that could blind us from eternity. This was God's wisdom in that. Rest for your body, reflection for your soul. That's not just on Fridays and Sundays, maybe a daily practice so that you can continually keep your soul fresh in the understanding of who God is for you and me. So this is what we see the main difference, to reflect, not just to rest. But now we see a shift. We come to Deuteronomy 5 and we scroll down to verse 28. And what Moses is doing here is he's reminding them not just of the law that came from Mount Sinai, but the reaction of the people when they heard the law. He takes the pain by the Holy Spirit, yes, to remind them of how absolutely terrified they were when they heard God's voice from that mountain. And he shares it in detail. Look at here in verse 28. After they heard it from verse 22 down, 
It says here, And the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all they have spoken. When you go back to Exodus 20 and 18 to 21, you get what we see in this portion of Deuteronomy there. And what do you see? Well, let's just turn there. Exodus 20. Look at verse 18. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off, and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So this is what you see, the commandment being blasted from Mount Sinai, and to add to the whole scene, you got smoke, you got fire, you got lightning, you got trumpet sounds, you got the earth shaking, and they are rightfully scared, shaking to the core of their being, and they say, Moses, you speak for us. Moses replies, says, don't be scared, I'm just here to bring the word from God that he's testing you, and we see no inclusion of God's direct speech until you come to Deuteronomy. Until you come to Deuteronomy, you see the, another angle to this whole scenario that brings rich insight. What do you think God's reaction to the people trembling and being terrified was like? What was his response to their response? When they were shaking in their boots or their sandals, and when they cried out for Moses, to be a mediator between them and God. Well, we look down here, what do we see? In verse 28. The Lord heard your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people. Isn't it amazing that when you're talking to somebody else, God hears it? I love that. They spoke to Moses, but God heard it. The Lord heard the words, and he said, they are right in all that they have spoken. They're right. What were they right in? They were right in their request for a mediator. See, that whole manifestation of God's majesty, transcendence, holiness, was to bring them to that exact place in which they cried out for somebody to stand in the gap. God purposefully showed himself strong. And as the people stood in the very presence of God, they realized their own depravity, they realized their own lack, they realized their own lack of holiness, and in that, they realize that there's a gulf between us and God, and we need somebody to stand in the gap. And God goes, that's what I wanted. God wanted them to realize that they needed somebody to represent them. God wanted them to come to the place where they were so humbled by the fact that he's so pure and they're so impure that they needed somebody to speak on their behalf and relate to God for them. Do you think God's desire is any different today? No, it is the very same thing that God wants to bring every single person that lives on this planet and still has breath. God wants to bring every single individual to that same realization. He's holy. I'm not. I can't have relationship with this God unless somebody stands on my behalf. And that's what the gospel does. See, we got to be very careful of how we preach the gospel. If we remove the holiness of God, if we remove God's holy standard, if we remove the fact that He is perfect and pure and we require such from humanity, we give them no reason to cry out for a mediator. We give them no reason to see their need for someone to stand in the gap. And what was the means by which God brought them to that place? Was it just the fire? Was it the trumpet? Was it the shaking? The law. It was the law. What penetrated so deeply into their souls? The fact that all this command of the, the holiness of God shone so brightly in the darkness of their inner being that they go, we're done. We're finished. And the same tool that God used is the same instrument that we must use as we present the truth to others. The law. It is the law that will show people their need for a perfect Savior. It is the law that will show that no matter how much we think we are righteous, we always fall short of the glory of God. It is the law that will break the proud need of the sinner to be broken and contrite in spirit. It's the law. It's the law. 
So God says they are right in what they have spoken. They need a mediator. May God give us the empowerment and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to present the law to our co-workers, to our friends, to our family members. Don't assume that everybody thinks that they know they're sinners. A lot of people think that they're righteous. And it's the law that will bring them to the place where they cry out for a mediator. But that wasn't God's only response. To the fact that they were, yes, crying out for a mediator, but look what he says here in verse 29. You can feel the emotion that comes from the heart of God. Look. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always. To fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. So God heard their words and God clearly had seen the fact that they were totally petrified by the fact that this God is speaking to us out of fire and I can't see him, but I can feel him. And you know what God's reaction to that was? Moses, Moses, oh, go tell him to calm down. Tell him to stop. No, Moses goes, oh. That they would fear me like this always. This implies deep desire. This shows great longing for the people who were in that state to remain in that state. Now, there is a limit to this fear. Why? Because we read in Exodus 20, 20, that Moses, speaking on behalf of God, said what? Do not fear. But God said, oh, that they would always fear me. Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may always be with you so that you may not sin against him. We dealt with this in the series in the books of Exodus, but here's a reminder, two types of fears. Can anybody simply explain what the fear of God is? If somebody were to come out to you and say, what is the fear of the Lord? I've read it in Psalms. I've read it in Proverbs. I'm seeing it in Deuteronomy. Please tell me what it means for God to say, oh, that they may fear me like this always. Because I read in Exodus where he goes, don't fear. To have a deep reverence and respect to not upset and to not anger God. Very simply put. There is a fear of God and there's a fear of displeasing God. And it's the second one that God is after in you and me. There is a fear of God hurting me, and then there's a fear of me hurting God. Which one do you think God wants? The second one. And so he goes, oh, that they might have this fear always. Not sometimes, always. I have two questions for us tonight. Number one, do you believe that God, the God that we just read of, that desired that same thing, do you believe this God still requires and desires that same fear from his people today? Or is this an old covenant theme? Well, it's very much new covenant. So here's my second question. Why do we not hear of it so often? If not at all. Because when I read this in Deuteronomy 29 of chapter 5, look at the blessing that comes from it. That it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. That it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. So why are we holding back on declaring, teaching, understanding the fear of the Lord? Why are we afraid of the fear of the Lord, is a better question. Let me read this to you. You can turn there in Isaiah 66, verse 1. I would encourage you to turn there. And as you go to Isaiah 66, scroll your finger down to verse 2. And look what Isaiah says. In verse 2, All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Do you see it? So this idea of trembling comes to the book of Isaiah. What's the understanding? Go back to verse 1. Look what it says. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you should build for me or would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? I own everything. All of this stuff that you're making for me actually comes from me. And he goes, do you know what I really desire? Do you know what I really long for when it comes to where I want to place my presence? where I want to give my recognition, where I want to give my manifestation. It's not in a building. It's not in a location. It's not in a cathedral. It's not in a church house. 
This is where and to who I will look upon. And then he describes. So here's the question that we can ask all of ourselves. One, do I want God to rest upon my life? Do I want God to give me his eyes upon me? If so, it's going to require three things. What does it say? But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble. One, humble. I got to be humble. I got to realize continually of my personal inability before God. I got to be humble. That there's nothing that God asks of me that I can perform in my own strength, in my own wisdom, in my own gifting. I need the assistance and the empowerment of God. Thank you so much, sweetheart. And water? Wow. Humble. But not just humble. Contrite in spirit. For a person to walk with an awareness of the damage that sin causes in my relationship to God, mainly, and with man, and is broken over it whenever I fall into it. Contrite in spirit. And lastly, trembles at my word. This is whom to I will look. I'm looking for a resting place. I'm looking for somewhere where I can make myself known. And I'm not looking for anything on the earth that has to do with a building. I'm looking for a person that's humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. You say, what does it mean to tremble? Does it mean to quake and shake? No. What it means is that you revere God's word, and here it is, you fear to disobey it. That whatever decisions that you partake in, no matter what fellowship you are part of, no matter what you plan for your future, what you have continually in mind is, does it align with the written, revealed word of God? And when God sees somebody who trembles at his word, he goes, that's somewhere where I can rest. That's somewhere that I can make my, my presence known in and through, humble, contrite in spirit, trembles at my word. Just sit tight for a moment. I'm going to read just from the book of Proverbs. I'm just going to read these verses. Just from the book of Proverbs to hear the blessings that come from fearing God. Ready? Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Proverbs 3, 7 and 8. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Proverbs 15, 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. You have a lot of people chasing treasure when they should be chasing the fear of God. Proverbs 16, 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. Are you saved? It's because of steadfast love and faithfulness. Iniquity is atoned for because of steadfast love and faithfulness. But you want to know how you turn away from sin? And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. I thought it was through steadfast love and faithfulness that I turn away from evil. No, it's by you and I fearing God. Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. Are you not satisfied with life? Are you always running around chasing things, trying to fill that emptiness? You know what you have to chase after? The fear of God. Whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Proverbs 22, 4. The reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. So hold on. To have the fear of the Lord is to have safety, is to have wisdom, is to have contentment, is to have life, is to have security, is to have satisfaction. So let me ask the question again. Why are we so afraid of the fear of the Lord when all these things come with it? And here's another question. How do I know I have the fear of the Lord? It's one thing to say it. 
It's one thing to sing it. It's one thing to quote it. It's one thing to post it on my Facebook. How do I know I have the fear of God? How do I make that distinction within me that I'm not terrified of God hurting me, but I'm terrified of hurting God? He's saying, why are you going on this tangent of the fear of the Lord? Because now we're in chapter 6. And when you come to chapter 6, I want you to look at three verses. Look at verse 2. Look what it says. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Remember, Moses has come to the place where he's not trying to get the people to get in. He wants the people to stay in the promised land. And now he says, fear. Fear God, verse 2. Then you go down and you read in verse 13. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Okay? And I keep reading, and then I come to verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as we are this day if you have been with us for the past three weeks we've been discussing how we can remain in the will of God like the people would in the promised land one was three weeks ago what was it respond to the word of God with reverence reflect the word of God in faithfulness and retell the word of God with passion. Then we came to chapter three, and chapter four mainly, and we discussed how we have to understand the God of this word, that he's a jealous God. What else is he? He's a merciful God. What else is he? He's incomparable. Because we're not just relating to a text, we're relating to a person that's given us a text. And now we've come to this point in the book of Deuteronomy, and Moses is still giving insight to how you and I can remain in the lane of blessing and promise. And it comes through something called fear. The fear of God. And so he repeats it three times in chapter 6. And the question is still on the table, how do I know I have it? How do I know I have it? I will say this, that it is testable. There is a way in which you and I can measure whether I actually have the fear of God in my life. It's not ambiguous. It's not random. It's not a feeling. I feel like I fear God. No, there is a way for God to test it in you. And if you really want it, you better believe that God's not just going to put it in your heart. God is going to bring you to a place where he's going to test you to see if you actually have it. I think one of the main places to go, and we've been there before, but we're going to springboard off of that, and we're not going to turn there, but hear me, is with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac, we know the story in Genesis 22. What's the story in Genesis 22? We should have it in the map of our minds. What happens in Genesis 22? Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. Abraham gets word from God that he wants, he wants him to sacrifice his son. And he goes without hesitation, wakes up the next day, wakes up early, it says. I mean, you know, wake up early to sacrifice your son. Then it's a three-day journey. So he had some time to think about it. God could have brought it to a closer location. He says, let's just get this over with. I'll do it fast because I have the motivation. No, three days to contemplate and think, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to sacrifice my son? I've waited so long for this promise. And now all of a sudden, God wants me to get rid of this promise. He comes up to the place, he lays his son down, ties him, lifts up the knife, and then the angel of the Lord appears on the scene and says this. Let me read it to you. It says, he said, do not lay, in verse 12 of Genesis 22, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. Seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Okay. So there was something that Abraham did. He was being tested by God to see if what he was looking for in Abraham was really there. And he found it. You fear God. Why? Because you did not withhold the most precious thing in your life from me. Do you want to know how God will test? If you fear God, you won't like it, I'm sure, but it's good to know. Oftentimes, as we're going to find out, the way God will test if you and I really fear him is when he will measure your love for another person to him. 
And he wants to find out, even to the closest person that you have in your life, do you love your Isaac more than me? Do you love your friends more than me? Do you love your siblings more than me? Do you love your son more than me? Do you love your mom more than me? Do you love your father? Do you love your pastor more than me? God will measure your love with your love for another, and he will see if it competes or if yours is greater for him than for anybody else. And you will be surprised how in the wisdom of God, he will test to see if you're willing to let go of the thing that you held on to for so long. You'll be shocked to know. So I remember just reading this saying, that's how God tests it. And it's not just in an isolated incident with Abraham. Because I know of somebody in the Bible who failed to let go of his sons. Can you think of a person who failed to let go of his sons and show that he feared his sons more than he feared God? Is there anywhere in the Bible where we see an example of somebody who failed the test of letting go of his sons for the purpose of honoring God and honored his sons? Eli. Eli had two sons. And Eli, unfortunately, is a negative example of somebody who feared his sons more than fearing God. Can we turn there? 1 Samuel chapter 2. This is profound. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29. At this point, you have an unknown, better word, unnamed man of God that comes up to Eli, who's a high priest. Now listen to this. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were rebellious sinners that were in ministry. It's possible to be in ministry and be a rebellious sinner. Not just in the temple days, in the tabernacle days, 2019. They were eating food that was dedicated to God. They were sleeping with women at the entrance of the tent of meeting that we're serving. They were immoral. They were proud. They were gluttons. And now a man of God comes up to Eli, who is the father of these two sons, and he makes this remarkable statement to Eli that probably even gives us a deeper insight to why Eli's judgment was so severe. If you've read this story, you've probably thought to yourself, man, even Eli rebuked his sons. You read it early on in, in verse 22 of chapter 2, where Eli actually comes up to his sons and says, what are you guys doing? I'm hearing from everybody that you're doing all this mess. Do you not know that if you sin directly against God, there's no mediator? You're in trouble. I mean, you see a rebuke from the Father, and you read down, and you see a man of God show up and says, you're done. It's over. God is going to cut off your descendants. It's, it's finished. You go, how? Then you read verse 29 very carefully, and you see something so profound. It says here in verse 29 of chapter 2, why then do you scorn my sacrifices? This is God speaking through the man of God to Eli. And my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling... And honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel. Whew. Did you read that carefully? That part that sticks out is what? You've honored your sons above me. But read carefully. It says, by fattening yourselves. So you know what happened? This is what happened. You had Hophni and Phinehas that would eat the fat of the sacrifice that belonged to God. You would put it on the altar, and that was to go up as incense before the Lord as a pleasing aroma. They go, no, we want it. So they despised the sacrifices. But you know what they did? They brought some of that fat home for a late night dinner. And guess who was at the table and wasn't complaining about it? Eli. So you had Eli benefiting from the compromise of his sons and fattening himself. This makes sense now. Because when you scroll up in verse 22 and you read of the rebuke, we see that the reason why they rejected the rebuke was because it was the will of the Lord for them to die. But here's another added detail, I believe. That the reason why the sons could not take their dad seriously because he himself was a hypocrite. You're telling us to stop living this way when you're eating the fat too and we bring it home? We can't take your word seriously. And God says, you've honored your sons above me. Do you know how Eli died? Go to chapter 4, verse 18. Of 1 Samuel 4, 18. Let's see how Eli died. This is when the ark of God was taken by the Philistines. He gets word back as a high priest that the ark of God is gone. 
As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken and he died, for the man was old and what? Heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. What you sow, you will reap. He fattened himself with the sacrifices, and it was his very own weight that brought his demise. You're fattening yourself with the sacrifices of God, and you're rebuking your children, that's fine, but you're in the mess of yourself. And how does he die? His weight literally crushes his neck. And there's a principle that whatever we sow in our sin, it will come back to get us. It's a principle throughout the scriptures. It's true with Saul, with the Amalekites. What happens? Saul goes out. God says, destroy all the Amalekites. Don't leave one alive. And he leaves the king alive and some sheep. And you read that Saul commits suicide. But when you read the story later on, you realize that an Amalekite comes and brings news to David that he saw Saul in his almost fully death state. And he asked the Amalekite to kill him. So the very thing that Saul failed to kill ended up killing him. It's a principle throughout the Bible, especially the Old Testament in picture form, that whatever we fail to sow will ultimately come up and destroy us. But then you read about a boy in the midst of all of that compromise. You read about Hophni and Phinehas. You read about Eli who failed to live righteously before his children and to correct them with action, to remove them from ministry. He didn't do that because what? He feared his sons. I love my boys more than I love God. And you know who's watching all of this? Another little boy. What's his name? Samuel. He's watching. And it says that he's growing up in stature and he's growing up in wisdom and he's growing up in his knowledge of God. And Samuel is no longer a boy when you come to chapter 8. Samuel now is a dad. And Samuel has his own two sons. Uh Uh-oh. It's not just two sons. What do we read in 1 Samuel 8? If we can put it up, Sarah, please. Verse 1 and 2. 1 Samuel 8. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Who made his sons judges over Israel? God? Samuel. Samuel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. And what happened? Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. So let's let's take this bit by bit. Number one. Let's learn this about Samuel up to this point. Amazing prophet. I love the story of Samuel. He grew up in the presence of God. I love Samuel's mother who gave up his son, her son, to grow up in the presence of God. But even prophets make mistakes. And the mistake that this prophet made was that he, in his own wisdom, his own understanding, his own calculation, made his son's judges when he should have sought God on it. He appointed his sons to be judges when he should have sought the Lord to know who would step into a leadership role. Okay? And this is what happens after that. He pays the price for it to an extent. The people do the same thing that they did with Hophni and Phinehas. They go up to their dad and say, listen, your sons are messing up here. They're unrighteous. They're not living holy. They're not living to the standard they're called to as leaders. And this is where it gets interesting. What is Samuel going to do? Is Samuel going to make the same mistake as Eli? Is Samuel, in his pride perhaps, or perhaps in the fear of offending his children, who are grown adults to be judges, is he going to say, forget about it, it's not a big deal. Is Samuel going to fear his sons more than he fear God? Who thinks that he doesn't do anything about it and lets them live on? I love this game because nobody puts their hand up, really. So let's just skip it. Do you have an answer? Tell us the answer. He does make a change. So you read chapter 8 and you see that it's a very similar situation to Eli. You have a leader with two sons in ministry that shouldn't be in ministry. But Eli failed to show that he feared God and he feared us. He honored, that's another way of saying it to some degree. He honored his sons more than God. 
you come to chapter 12, 1 Samuel. And what do we see? This is when Samuel now gives his speech concerning a king that's going to come in. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice and all that you've said to me, and I've made a king over you. Now look at this. This is why we have to read very slowly. And now behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you. My sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Why would he include his sons in this speech? Why would he make this point? What does it even mean to say, my sons are with you? It's another way of saying this. They are removed from their position of leadership, and they are amongst the common people. I did what I had to do to make sure that they would not remain in that place of leadership. Samuel proved that he can let go of his sons for the honor of God. Abraham proved that he can let go of his precious son for the honor of God. Eli failed to let go of his sons for the honor of God. And I remember reading, just even before leaving to come here, thinking, why did Samuel do that? Why did Samuel have that reflex and Eli didn't? And I believe it's because Samuel saw the whole ordeal with his own eyes. Samuel witnessed what it's like to be a man who honors even your own children above God. He goes, I'm never going to make that mistake. I'm never going to put another human, no matter how close, even if they came from my own loins, I'm never going to put another person in a place that solely belongs to God. I will fear God all the days of my life. How do we know we fear God? Are you willing to let go? of what God tells you to let go of. That's how we know. And so we come now to verse 4 and 5 in Deuteronomy 6 in a very famous passage. Is the fear of God the only thing that God is after from us? Is this reverential awe the only thing that he requires from you and me as his people? Is it the only thing that he wants us to pass down to our children? According to chapter 6, there is a mirroring theme of what God is after from us and what God wants to pass on to our children. And it's not the fear of God, it's love for God. Love. Fear and love. And this is what we see in verse 4 as we close with these verses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Question, is love genuine if it's commanded? Is love sincere if it is required by demand from the object of the one who wants to be loved? That's a good question. You shall love the Lord your God. But what if I don't love you? Can love be commanded in such a way and be sincere and genuine? Anybody have any insight to that? I say yes, Daniel. Um, If it's commanded, I think it goes with with having that fear of God, you, ha- you show love to God by fearing Him. It's similar to, say, uh, a spouse. You know, I, I, I love Him, I will respect Him. That shows respect and they go together, I'd say. So can I say from what you're saying that based on the covenant that you have with the significant other, it demands love because you're in that covenant, yeah? I think there's something there, absolutely. Evan, and then Barrett? So God saved us from ourselves. In the Old Testament, He saved His people, the Israelites, from the Egyptians, from a life of slavery. And in this new covenant, we are saved by Christ who sheds blood for us. So right. how can we not, out of adoration, and realize realization for what He's done for us, who He's, you know, the people who He's saved have, should reflect on that act of love and righteousness and in return show love and faith. So 
to just simplify what you're saying is that the command for God to love him is actually the appropriate response to his love for us that he initially gave. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, just to add to that, I, I believe he commands it because it's the best thing for us. We disobey and we're the ones missing out. So yes, the command is love me. So what Barrett's saying is that, if I could say it this way, God's asking of our love for him is not because he has a need, but because we have a need, right? And our love towards him ultimately fulfills and it's for our good. You guys actually covered the points. That's right. Let me say this. For God to say, you shall love the Lord your God, implies option, implies the freedom to choose. This is not a forceful thing. If God wanted us to be forced to love him, we wouldn't have the option to choose. We'd be wired to love him. So he, he, he offers the opportunity. This command, don't see it as a forceful hand on the neck thing. See it as an invitation. It's an invitation to love God. We make the choice to actually direct our affections towards him. So he gives us the freedom. Secondly, as already mentioned, for God to direct and to demand love from us tells us something about our hearts, that we've lost our way and he is nudging to us and saying, listen, direct your affections, direct your devotion towards me. Not towards things, not towards other people supremely, but towards me. Because why? Not because God has a need within himself to be loved. God is love within himself and he's a triune being that is experiencing fellowship and communion from eternity past to eternity future. What God is saying is you shall love me because you need this love. You're chasing, listen, by nature we are wired to chase after things, the pursuit of happiness. And what God is saying through this command is why don't you stop and come to me? Why don't you stop running around sipping on dirty water and broken cisterns and come drink from the well of life. Come. So this command is to redirect what we're already giving out to the world and to sin and to people that are not from God. And that is our affections, that is our devotions, that is our worship. And he's saying, no, you want that here. And lastly, we see here, that as Evan mentioned, when you go to Deuteronomy 4.37, we can read it from Deuteronomy 4.37. Look at the motivation of why God delivered the Israelites from Egypt. And because he loved your fathers. Because he loved. You came out of Egypt. You're at this place, Israelites, at the border into the promised land. Because I loved you, would you not love me? And then he tells us the type of love he wants. The intensity of the love. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. What is he saying there? It's, it's a way of making a statement of totality. Every fiber of your being, every facet of your existence, every fabric of who you are should be in love, drenched with the dew of adoration for me. Can God demand such a love? Can, can God demand, does he have the right to ask of us to be completely given over to him in such a way? It doesn't sound like a demand when you realize that he's already done everything to give himself over to us. I mean, the extent of God's love towards you and me shouts his love for us. There's a blood-stained cross that makes that statement. And so God has given all that he can. Listen, God is God. He has the right to demand love for him just for who he is. If Christ never died for us, he is still worthy of love. He's still worthy of worship and surrender and service. You say, how can you say such a thing? Everything is based upon the sacrifice on the cross. I'll prove it to you this. There are seraphim in heaven that are singing that have never known redemption. There are angels that are worshiping non-end that instantly obey God when he gives the command to go out into the world and do whatever he calls them to do. And they don't know forgiveness. They don't know the sacrifice that Christ has given for their souls. You and I do. So how much more? How much more? And even if he didn't, he would still be worthy to say, you shall love the Lord your God. But he did. So how much more shall we? But God, as we close is not just concerned about this generation. He has in mind future generations. So then he comes to verse 7. He says, You shall teach them diligently to your children 
and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Remember, for the people to fear God, it was to be taught to the kids. For the people to love God, was to be taught to the children. God has in mind your children right now. Anybody in here have children? Anybody in here hope to have children? Saw some hesitations there. I hope not. They're a heritage from the Lord. This is for all of us. Whether this generation had children yet or not, they're young in some sense. They're about to enter into the reality of building their own homes and God wants to prepare them from this point on, even before building their houses in the promised land, which tells me something. We should know how to build our homes in the spiritual sense and in practical sense before we actually have a home. I think the church really needs to get back on knowing how to teach young people how to be husbands, fathers, mothers, and wives. I was reading Titus earlier today and was thinking about what it says to older women in the church, in that pastoral epistle. It says, older women teach younger women how to be sober, how to be pure, how to love their husbands and their children how to be the keepers of their home. That discipleship needs to happen continually. And it's the same with men, not just women. So God wants to teach. God wants to teach and, 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 and directly put their fear and their love, not just towards God, but to teach it towards their children. What's the best way to do that? Here's two points just from this text. We're going to learn from Deuteronomy how to build a spiritual house on a personal basis. Two ways. Number one, by my own observation and keeping the law. Look at verse six. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Before he says, teach them to your children, he says, they shall first be on your heart. In other words, they should sit on the seat of your affections, your desires, your pursuits as parents. You know, you hear from a lot of parents that are lukewarm, that are living worldly, and yet they still have ambitions for their children to be godly. It's a strange thing. But here's my question. How is that going to be true if they're watching your life and they're not seeing the passion that you want for them? Not only that, you have it in every sense of the way. You have people that are not committed to the local church, that want their children to be committed to the local church. And my question is, if you're not committed to the local church, how are your kids going to be committed to the local church? It has to be on your heart and mind. Mothers aspire for their daughters to be, to find a godly man. Listen, you can't find a godly man if you're not a godly gal. The best way to find a godly man is to be a godly girl. The best way to find a godly girl is to be a godly man. And you have these aspirations from parents, but it must be on your heart. And so the law has to sit there in the heart and not just come from the mouth, because the greatest damage to any teaching from a parent to a child or from a pastor to the pew, the greatest damage to any teaching is a testimony that doesn't line up with it. And so when God gives the instruction, he says, before you even dare teach anything, let it burn in your bosom. You be convinced of it. You fear it. You tremble at the word. You love God with everything within you. Because more than your speech, they're watching your life. So he says, let it be on your heart. Because passion is more often caught than it is taught. Passion is more often caught than it is taught. You know what I mean by that? That when I live passionately for God, sometimes that can have a greater effect when I'm consistent to rub off on another and infect another person than if I'm just saying it and not reflecting it. There's a contagious element with true consistency in the walk with God. And it has an effect on other people. So it has to be on my heart. I have to, by my own observation of the law, hope that it will be caught by my children. And from that place, we come to verse 7, where it says, by not just my observation, but my willing conversation. My willing conversation. There is a practice of formal teaching from a parent to a child. And that's getting harder and harder when life is so busy. When your children are at school most of the day. But I see something else. I see not as much formal teaching as much as I do as casual conversation. Do you see that here? Like when you lie down, when you walk, 
when you rise, when you sit in your house. I see this emphasis on just knowing how to include Jesus in every element of life. Knowing how to invite Jesus in the mundane activities in the household, family vacation, outings, going out to eat, taking your kids to school. May God give every parent, currently and future, the wisdom to know how to deposit nuggets of truth. And I think what Moses is teaching here by the Spirit is that there is a way in which we know how to just include God in all that we do. That parents should be able to, it's not saying here that you don't talk about anything else but the law. You don't say, hey, wake up for breakfast. No, and you start quoting Deuteronomy. No, it's not none of that. It's not an extreme view. What it's saying is, is that you and I simply must know how to, as natural as talking, as natural as breathing, show our relationship with God to be so intimate and for it to be even in the way we speak to one another. So it should just slip up as we're sitting at the dinner table. It should be something that's talked about in the car. It should be something that as we're talking wherever, that Jesus ends up showing up somehow. Something that you learn from the word of God shows up somehow. By my own observation, by my willing conversation, I can tell you as, a, I remember this vividly. There are many things I've forgotten in my childhood. This is one of the things I remember. I shared a bunk bed with my, my brother. I always got the bottom, unfortunately. But I was in the bottom bunk. And I remember my mom wrote, because the, the top bunk was there, and it was just like, you know, like a panel of wood. And I remember to this day, not just what was written, but how it was written. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. Just there. So I went to bed seeing that. I woke up seeing that. And I will remember how my mother, many nights, would kneel by my bed as I laid in bed and would just deposit truths of God into my heart. I remember, I remember this conversation for some reason so distinctly. I remember that my mom was talking about her love for God. I'm not, I'm not saying this out of exaggeration. This is true. And she was telling me before, as my eyes were closing, she was telling me how her love for God was greater than any other love she had. So I was offended. I says, wait a minute. You love God more than you love dad? She goes, I do. You love, wait, wait a minute. You love God more than you love me? And Peter and Pauline and Ben, she goes, I love God more than your dad, more than you, more than Pauline, more than Peter, more than all of you. I was, gen you know, I wasn't saved. I was offended. I was thinking to myself, what? why? And she says, because if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have your dad. And if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have you. I wouldn't have your brothers. I wouldn't have your sister. God gave me all these things, so I have to love him. And I do love him more than I will ever love you. Teach them when they lie down, when they rise up, when they walk. I'll leave you with this verse. Parents and parents-to-be. Isaiah 54, verse 13. Look at this wonderful promise for the people of God. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Isaiah 54, 13, all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Do you want that to be a reality in your home? Do you want your kids to be directly taught and discipled by the Lord himself? I'll tell you how it's going to happen. I'll tell you how this will be a greater reality in your current marriage or your marriage to be, when Jesus is number one. When Jesus is number one for you, husband, even more than your wife. When Jesus is number one for you, wife, even more than your husband, you can know that where two are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. And when Jesus is in the midst of the home, it creates a heavenly atmosphere. And when the heavenly atmosphere is there, you can believe that your children will have a greater chance of serving them for themselves. If you're looking for a future wife, my brother, and if you're praying for one, Pray this prayer, Lord, let her love you more than she will ever love me. Sister, if you're praying for a husband, let this be your prayer. Lord, 
let him love you more than he'll ever love me. That's how you will know a happy marriage. Because when there will be trying times in which you might even in the flesh lose all motivation to love the other, your love for God will keep you in obedience, will keep you in humility, will keep you in submission, will keep you leading. If you've placed a person as the supreme object of your love and fear, when that person fails you, so will your motivation to move forward in obedience. But when there's the one who will never fail you, never disappoint you, never change on you, you will always have the fuel to remain faithful, even to those who might not be operating in faithfulness in the time. We need that mixture, that holy blend of fearing God, loving God. I said this was the last text, but it's not. Deuteronomy 4.10. I think we have an understanding of loving God. I think we understand. I know how I can love God. He's done so much for me. True. Amen. Praise be to his name. Here's a very practical way of learning how to fear God. Deuteronomy 4, verse 10. How on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words. So they're going to hear my words. Why? So that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children so. So between now and God testing you to see if you truly fear Him, you and I have to come to this Word and discover what kind of awe and reverence He demands from us so that I can learn how to fear God. The more I see how awesome he is, how holy he is, how perfect he is, how unchanging he is, how jealous he is, how ferociously loving he is, I will learn how to fear him. You stay away from this word, and you stay away from the fear of God. And when you stay away from the fear of God, you stay away from all those blessings that were listed from the book of Proverbs alone, never mind the whole scriptures. Lord, I'm coming to your word. Now teach me to fear you so that I can one day teach my children to both fear and love you. God still has instructions for us to know how to stay in his will. We've come to the point where it's going to require the fear of God and a love for God more than anything or anyone else. Let's pray. Psalms 86, 11 says, Unite my heart that I might fear your name. David prayed it. Lord, let my heart have the fear of God and let it be so real that when I actually come to the point where you test me on it, I can pass. right now in the name of Jesus we pray for this room and Lord if it's your desire for you that your people would fear you we say yes to it and we ask in Jesus name that you would give us the fear of God and we know Lord that it's not just going to happen like puppets on a string you're going to put us to the test and you're going to measure our love to you our honor to you with the love and honor that we might give to another, especially those that are closest to us. Lord, help us honor you and love you more than these. Lord, we pray for the love of God to be in our hearts, our soul, our strength, our minds. Pray for every parent in this house that you would give the wisdom and the fear of God which is the beginning of wisdom. To know how to live with the law in our hearts already before we teach it from our lips. And Lord, for every person that's aspiring for a wife or for a husband, may they find that person who has their hearts set on the word and who has a fear in their hearts for God. Lord, it is our desire that we would live long 
in your promises. Live long in your blessing. Live long as a light to the nations. And we realize tonight, Father in heaven, the same God that gave this word to the Israelites, you're giving it to us in this day of age. Give us the fear. Give us the love. We're humble, contrite in spirit. We tremble at your word. We can't do this without you. We can't move forward without you. Give us what we need, we ask. Give us what we need, we ask.